dude. <laughs> yo, 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 what's up, everybody? Good afternoon, good morning, and wherever part of the world you're at, be good to yourselves. My name is Danny Le. I'm a librarian here at the Santa Clara City Library, and I am grateful to have the one and only Bo Sia here with us today. So before we kick it off, Bo, I'm gonna read your short bio in your new book, Well Played, out by uh, Not A Cult uh, Media. Great uh, imprint, I'd say buy all their stuff, I did. They have a sale right now, so pick it up. So, Bo Sia is a Tony Award winning poet featured in all seasons of HBO's Depth Poetry and is the author of The Undisputed Greatest Writer of All Time. This one right here. Through his poetry, he explores the possibility of metaphor beyond the poem. Through his poems, he expresses the potential of metaphor to develop out of hurt, rising from being bound to a role, and to each, teach purpose more potent than power. Alliteration, I love it. Without further ado, give it up for both Sia. Thank you, thank you, Danny. My brother, I, I haven't talked to you for years. And uh, time. one, I apologize for that, but we're doing it now. And I'm so grateful to have you with, with us right now, so. It's awesome, man. I'm so grateful to be here. So grateful to be a part of this program that you've been putting together. I've been watching what you've been putting out and, and love the breadth of it, as well as just how it's going to add context and layers to your community and the greater community we share on the interwebs. Super important, these conversations. And it's just, and you know, it's also my responsibility of staying in touch. So please don't carry all of that. It's, it's a two-way thing. And I'm, I'm so grateful that this opportunity arose for us to reconnect. And we just got to create more of those for ourselves, you know. Yes, and you know what, and uh, I agree with that. There's no excuses, but we're, we're all carrying our paths in life, so we're just doing it. But to be able to do it like this and uh, share it with the community, it's, it's great. But uh, let's just kick it off. So where are you currently self-sheltering in place, and what sort of rituals have you been doing and practicing since the quarantine, you know, to keep yourself balanced and, and sane, you know? Right on. So uh, I, I currently uh, live in Burbank, California. It's like near, it's in Los Angeles County. And uh, I pretty much stay home all the time unless I have to go to groceries. Um, and then once a week, you know, trying to be a good Asian son and visit my parents outdoors on some social distance, outdoors only masks type of experience. And um as far as rituals and things, what's interesting about being a poet or as an artist is that I've spent a lot of uh, time by myself. And um, in, in those times by myself, we're talking about stretches of months, not interacting with people. And actually prior to this, I had a pretty strong grasp of being able to operate without needing sort of a lot of social interaction, whether that's my personality or my conditioning. I just was very comfortable with that aspect. Um, also, because I'm a poet, what has helped me through this is that I've done a lot of internal work. And uh, I'm not saying I'm far, I'm just saying I've done a lot. And because of that, you know, I, I speak to my friends about their process, some who aren't artists and things. And in this whole time period, they are experiencing how much of their life uh, was built around social stuff that may have prevented them from seeing other things going on inside. And now it's all coming up, right? Which can be really disconcerting for people. So um, all of that to, is to say for me, I was pretty fine going through it. I think my main things now is to not snap because of the forces in the world that want us to snap, mm. break down, kill each other and destroy the planet. Right. There are forces out there that want that us to do that. They want us to be the blame for the thing that they're trying to create around us. Right. So I the things I do mostly is remembering to talk to people. Really just call them, get comfort from them and comfort them. That is more important than fucking money right now is to comfort each other emotionally Two. Allow yourself and those you love all your feelings because in this time, all of your feelings are going to come up and the shame and the guilt and the feeling of wrong for those feelings is going to kill your heart. So what you got to do 
is say to your, the people in your life, hey, I'm going through, I'm kind of a mess today. I'm not gonna be acting right. And your friends, the people who love you should go, we all are gonna have that. We all are gonna be illogical during this because it is all unprecedented and designed to break us, right? Another thing I would say is have a grounding, grounding purpose. It doesn't have to be important to anyone else but yourself. But if your purpose is for the next six months, I'm going to get my garden right, get your garden right. Let it ground the rest of your day. If for the next six months you're like, I'm going to go through every junior high journal and type out all the dope lines, make that it. If it's, I'm going to finally write the screenplay, I'm going to learn how to be good at yoga, whatever it is, give yourself some sort of project or definitive purpose to guide the rest of your day or this blur, because it is indefinite, this blur will spin us out, right? Mm, mm. You know, the, one of the most important things you just said is how we, if we were not affirming each other before this pandemic, and connecting why is it why are a lot of people not still connecting you know mm -hmm. still in their cages at home or mm -hmm. not reaching out this is something that we and it's an internal thing and um it's i have my moments man that it gets crazy where i'm i think i'm alone which is not the not the truth i'm i'm, I'm able to still connect with people and so i'm just grateful that you're, I feel like I'm getting so much from you right now, but it's great that to hear that you're doing well and you know, you're staying healthy and also you're, you're sharing yourself in a genuine way. I'm seeing it on Instagram, uh, definitely through the poetry, but also just how uh, you're sharing your family with us. So mm -hmm. I know your pops was what, shaving down a tree or cutting down a tree oh, with a chainsaw. Yeah. No, I was out there cause uh, I had, that was me. I had to cut that tree oh, and I just you. looked like him. <laughs> but while I was cutting it, he was building something about 15 feet away from me, right? But yeah, I, as a young child in America, growing up in Oklahoma, so much of my environment told me my parents were wrong. Mm -hmm. And part of my self-work the last 15 years is to get to the truth of it. And through a lot of fights with my parents and a lot of misunderstandings, I finally arrived at this place with them where this is some of the most cherished moments I've ever had in my life. And I've gotten to do things most people dream of, you know, but these are the moments I realize I'll take to the grave in a way that, you know, just to make a quick example, I'm not going to remember radio city music hall, the way I'm going to remember building this deck I just built with my dad. It's not going to. Um, Talk a little bit about, you know, your upbringing in Oklahoma. That's something, one of the things I grew up uh, with you uh, kind of um, connecting because we both grew up in Oklahoma. Um, my memories might be different than yours, but can you tell us what young Bo was doing in uh, Oklahoma at that time? Yeah, yeah. Real, real quick, would you, would you on the north side of Oklahoma City, where are you from? I was like, uh, I was born in Duncan, um, but, you know, I was around the areas of Okmulgee, so I forgot which uh, part of Oklahoma that was. The fact that I didn't say Okmulgee, most people wouldn't know. That yeah. shows <laughs> Right, right, because everywhere in Oklahoma is named after a tribe they wiped yeah. out, right? Yeah. Um, so <laughs> fucked. Messed up. Sorry. Uh, so, yeah, I would say this. I always contextualize it this way, because there's an Asian, Amer Asian American Pacific Islanders today have a different reality. Yeah. And I always contextualize it this way. I'm from Oklahoma when there was no internet, okay? When cable only had 30 channels, okay? When these faces didn't exist except as a joke, literally. Not like it's in my mind, but literally, okay? And um, in that environment and reality, like I said earlier, I, I had a lot of who we were was inherently wrong because it was different. Um, I had a reality in which me ever vocalizing what I experienced was immediately dismissed. It's part of what led me to writing. Right. Uh, writing in a journal was how live, feeling so alone and unheard, my own friends even dismissing. That's what made it so hard. And that's why a journal became so important because where I could go there. I also dealt with obviously like most folks, uh, who are in those environments that look like this, uh, dealt with racism, both verbal, physical, emotional. 
um, different degrees than other people, right? We all have our different stories. It's all equally traumatizing. I mean, like, so for instance, you know, there are people I know who have suffered much more growing up, but I did go to a high school where there were openly a uh, badge and jacket wearing neo-Nazis walking around and that was okay. That was accepted. That's the kind of school I went to. Um, yeah. And uh, it wasn't easy, but it wasn't. What made it so much harder was people who didn't look like me telling me we were wrong. It would have been a much easier growing up if that wasn't a big part of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, the narrative uh, or the, the master narrative sometimes can mess us up, especially when uh, our intuition says it's wrong, you know, and we can't mm -hmm. fight back because everybody tells you, no, you're wrong, you know. Yeah. And, that's and you're a kid. You're 13. You don't have a lot of people around to articulate those things. I, like I always say this, I never had a non-white teacher until I was in college in New York, right? So my whole life, right? Who do I speak to? Who's gonna listen? Who's gonna understand? That wasn't there. Right? And then I, I can see where, when you did have, you know, more, I guess, diversity, uh, it was, was it strange for you? Uh, or just like something new that you're right, it's, this is okay. I can speak out, be more open, especially in college. I think a lot of times we, start discovering ourselves more in uh, that setting. But how about yourself when you moved to New York and you also started around this time uh, more of your poetry or open mic uh, career? Yeah, I mean, I, I did open mic in Oklahoma for three years before I moved to New York and I immediately just hit the ground running at the New York and Poets Cafe once I moved there because that would have been my dream at the time. But I would say this, like, you're right, I, I didn't have, not only was there no diversity in high school, what diversity there was, I horribly rejected because I was desperately trying to belong. And even in a documentary that I was in when I was 19, I talk about how I'm white on the inside, like it's a good thing. Um, how messed up was I back then at 19, right? Um, so I would say this about New York and sort of having all these new people in my life that, that weren't white. I would say it came in stages because big cities can trick you into thinking that they want differences, but they want differences that appeal to their sensibility and they don't really state that part. So even though I emerged very quickly in certain poetic worlds, worlds like the Neorican may have been more apt to seeing who I was Worlds like the Whitney Museum may have seen me more as like this sort of like accent to the evening and therefore could only wrap their head around so much. Um, I think that had I not moved to New York though and met so many different people, my whiteness would have really gone unchecked and eaten me alive and killed me because most Asian Americans, especially those of East Asian descent, don't generally consider how America uh, brings out this whiteness within them that they, they unconsciously perpetuate throughout their lives and construct a life in which they never have to confront or address that within themselves. If I don't meet people like uh, Saul Williams, if I don't meet people like Nancy Yap at the Asian American Writers Workshop, if I don't meet the members of the Feedback Collective, all 11 of us, uh, they do, they, then I don't get the seeds that help me later realize what this suffering is within me and how to free myself from it. And <clears throat> I'm glad you made that point to that building community is so important because I, all the people you mentioned, uh, I have the air to be, either been a fan of or been befriended them in, in real life. And it was a, it's that kinship that helps us, you know, find our identity. Cause I was at the time also writing and meeting you all. I didn't know who I was, whether Vietnamese American was not in my you know, vernacular to describe myself. I was just Asian, you know, from <laughs> California born from Oklahoma. I didn't know what to make of myself, but um, the fellowship, as you mentioned, helped, define 
or help me discover who I am slowly, not sh fast enough, but slow. Yeah. Right. Um, w when you're young, it's like, we get so hard on young people, like things need to click immediately. And as you grow into your mentorship, Danny, you recognize that one thing that's the most important thing you can do is give them those seeds, trust them, give them the tools, trust them to grow and be available. Should they, you know, ask questions, we want to challenge and push back, right? Be available. Right. Um, yeah. If, if, if I don't go to the Asian American writers workshop, I end up becoming a, a multimillionaire that sends the movement back 50 years. I'm talented enough to help white supremacy reign forever. So I have to check that all the time. Yeah. Um, we, we can harness so much power if we don't realize what we, damage we can do if we continue on a path of non-self-awareness. Um, so let's go draw back. So what led you to, you know, jumping in from poetry to, you know, going to the stage, going to more theater or even film? You know, was it an extension of your need for, uh, to express yourself through poetry or is it was something else that you wanted to kind of prove to yourself? Yeah, well, you know, in Oklahoma, even though I, I talk about this predominantly white environment on the weekends, we spend a lot of time with PACO, Philippine American Civic Organization of Oklahoma. And, uh, <laughs> you know, that environment was a lot of talent shows. So every weekend, I'm doing a dance choreo with my friend Brian. I'm doing a lip sync by myself of George Michael. I'm doing the tenickling with the other members of the community, right? So I was always performing on stage. And in truth, I only wanted to publish my poems, but I got rejected so much, I started going to open mics. Because at open mics, they can't tell, turn you down. They can't say no, right? So I got into open mics. And what I learned once I got to New York, the way I spoke and wrote verse in contrast to how I looked and the timing of 1995, they hadn't seen anything like that and it created an attraction to my work that actually didn't have much to do with my work as much as it had to do with the combination of factors that express this work, right? And that just gave me so much opportunity. And I always shied away from it till later in life that I was, since the age of five, been made a performer. And it only took me a while to like let go of the shame of that and really get into like, yeah, I perform on stage. There's nothing wrong with that because you know this. In poetry, there had been many years where it was like, if you're not printing it, you're not really it. Right. right? Performing, it's not poetry, right? Took me a while to get over that and understand that so many things of what I do, if I really listen to the people we, we revere, like Bruce Lee, uh, what is wrong with doing it my own way? What is wrong with performing to the level of body engagement that I do? What is wrong with writing a line that is simple so that it can allow the dynamics of the vocal range to play in every moment, right? Mm -hmm. Stuff like that. Yeah, and, you know, and I mean, hopefully you stop thinking that, you know, that culmination of factors is what makes you who you are or, or great in other people's eyes. I think you stand alone as one of the original <laughs> uh, styles that out there that I can think of. Nobody else is a Bo see it. I mean, let alone you being a person who you are. Nobody's out there like a Bo see it. You're one of a kind. And it's just a, the matter that you present yourself. It's, it's, so, uh, it's so powerful. Uh, I believe that uh, for a lot of Americans or a lot of people around the world seeing probably you for the first time was through Deaf Poetry, uh, the, the television show on HBO, and right. that you appeared for majority of all the seasons, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. I, see, I saw you through all your hair changes and, <laughs> and costume changes over the years, and uh, it was a proud moment because uh, not just you, but a lot of our friends who have APIA uh, backgrounds were on that show. So to see a lot of, you know, uh, Asian poets and Pacific Island poets and uh, those of the diaspora be on, you know, kind of cable TV, it gave us some pride. So can mm -hmm. you talk about how your experiences, you know, uh, moving yourself from the slams, the open mics to uh, cable TV, how did that um, go about for your career? 
for my career. Yeah, yeah sure. So I would say that um, that's a very interesting thing to say. Uh, <laughs> well, is, did it did it change uh, as you were appearing on HBO? Was it did it change the trajectory of your uh, what you were doing prior to that? Did more people pick you up for gigs or? Yeah, I would say it like this. It's a double-edged sword. Yeah. So I think that what happens is this happened to me when I was age of 23. And I'll say this, when you are that young and, and you're like myself, who was really trying to be considered important, belong, or great, right? which are all unreal delusions. But I was chasing it still at the time. And when I was living in that mentality at that young age, what had occurred was, you know, Russell comes along and they, they, they do the pitch for the show and they bring us all on to pitch the show to HBO to perform it. And suddenly you are on someone else's agenda and train. And what can be really challenging about that, which later in life made my road a lot harder, was that I gave up some of my agency to be a part of something that's way more established than myself. And in that forgot to establish my truth definitively in the midst of it and started over time because my time with Dev Poetry was a three-year process. Mm -hmm. And in that three-year process over time, I became more an extension of their agenda than a representative of myself. You know, you have to understand the three poems I do on Broadway caused me to only recite those three poems for close to two years and not write any other poems. And those poems were written five to eight years before I did them for Broadway. So it's as a poet, unlike an actor, that locks you in the age you were when you wrote that stuff. Because wow. you're not the actor sharing someone else's work. You're the poet representing these poems as your current now over and over and over and over again, right? So that's, that's the hard part, along with finding out that whiteness is everywhere and you had to be more alert than looking for common tropes okay but the blessings is this man after i started doing that show man asian people suddenly wanted to book me at colleges did you know that prior to this only uh, white student unions wanted to book me at colleges but after i got on hbo asian people suddenly wanted to hire me it was crazy. Also, you know, because of it, uh, the performative level allowed me to then become be in films because the assumption was my performative ability translated to film acting, which not actually true. <laughs> no, all right. Uh, but I, I'll work on it. I've been working on it. Um, also, I would say that both the blessing and the curse is that anytime the system deems you valid of its sort of a representation of expression you get a lot more free stuff you know and it's super weird and it messes with you but it's also nicer because I've also in the last like I said to you privately earlier in the last 10 to 15 years I've been learning what it's like to live day to day week to week right what it's like to live going how long can I not pay the electric bill or how many days can I just eat eggs and rice or you know how many events do I have to skip because I can't pay the parking meter? Whatever it is, right? How many years am I going to wear this t-shirt? Whatever. And so in learning, living this, it gave me an appreciation for people being very nice to me. But when I was 23, I let it affect my ego in a way that was very harmful. Does that answer your question? Yeah, man. I'm, I'm, I'm just curious because I'm, I rarely get to hear this period of your life, especially your creative life. And I just wanted to ask it because it's a big thing. You know, I, I didn't have HBO. I had to go borrow it from a friend. And every time it went on air, I, I was riveted because being able to see my friends in, you know, on that screen, it made me very proud. Uh, I think it made a lot of us proud too. Um, but, you know, I always want to know what was going through your mind being on uh, kind of in that contract, you know, period of your life to that uh, organization and, and show. Well, yeah, I would say there's a lot of positives and I'm not trying to make it all negative. I just think it's like sometimes we talk about things only one way or the other. And I try, I, I'm going to do as I get older, more mixed bag. So uh, something you did speak to. One thing that was great 
because I got put on, they were more open to the people that really need to be there more than me. Now, granted, I get it. I, I make, uh, unlike most of our peers, there's something about me that uh, for whatever reason, uh, non-Asians can embrace my work in a way, okay? There's, I don't know what that is, right? Uh, let others debate yeah, this. Figure it but out. because of it, Dennis, Dennis and Kane got on the show, right? Ishley Park got on the show, right? Uh, Marlon got on the show, right? Like tons of people got on the show, you know what I'm saying? Um, and I wanted to say this other thing, side note, backtrack. I may have become an original over time, but my originality is born from the work of those before me. You, I got to give it up to Reggie Kabiko. Mm, mm. Reggie, like Reggie Kabiko laid it down so that I could do what I did at the New Yorican. If he's not on that team a year or two prior to me, right? I think three years prior to me, then it doesn't set up that New Yorican world for me, right? And then it doesn't set up the next step, right? So there's that. Um, and it was a great experience. I think it's only now that I'm starting to talk about the challenging parts because I want to help younger Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders know what to go for, but not diluted, be diluted in what it says it is, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, that's a big thing and probably leads up to my next few questions because in Well Played, uh, everybody please pick it up. Um, you sound more uh, sage-like. Uh, you're, you're bringing more um, stories and you know, cautionary tales to young artists. I, I believe that's what, who you're talking to in some cases in some poems, and as well as you know, experiences of your life through the, your career to uh, explain what's going on or, or the things that happened to you that uh, were not always good in uh, your experiences in poetry, also in, in acting. Can you talk, maybe if I'm not right or wrong, can you talk a little bit about what, um, what were you feeling and what were you trying to convey in a lot of these poems? Sure. I think that there are a couple of themes personally for me that I needed to work out within myself and put into the book. Um, just a little quick background. Uh, originally, this book was uh, going to be called something else. And I wanted to call it something else because I thought I had the definitive answer on race and supremacy in America. And I figured, thought I could figure it out. In the process of three years getting to writing this, what I really learned was, no, you don't do that. You only contribute what you actually earned what you lived, right? And I started really refining what that is. So even with some of the poems you sent to me as your list of poems you might like to hear today, you know, you reminded me they all fit into some kind of bucket. So some of the poems are literally poems I wish I had written at 18 if mm -hmm. I felt that I had the permission. Mm -hmm. I even know that today some of those poems are rudimentary in their construct, in their design, but it's, I didn't write it for that. I write it to make the 18 year old in me free, all right? Second, there's a lot of poems in there where I'm tired of everyone trying to be definitive. So I created these teaching moment poems, like I'm a voice, where I specifically go into, because it was originally called I'm the voice, mm. which is so wrong. <laughs> so I went into how I am a voice for something, but also it's to pass the ball back to others who are rising into their voices to say, well, what am I a voice for, right? To create that. There's another bucket of poems in there, as we spoke on prior, prior like has been, and that bucket of poems is about all of us who are gassed up with all these ideas of how, who are supposed to be, and often live in that who we're supposed to be to the detriment of our whole lives and never get to be who we actually are. And I wanted to write these poems to not say, uh, let it go, you failed, but to be like, you don't know what you lived through was for, and until you appreciate it for what it was, you're never gonna, you're never gonna get there, mm -hmm. right? As long as you make it like, 
oh, why didn't this ever happen? Or oh, how could he have it and not me? Or, oh, I was supposed to be here by 35. Like, if, if you do all that, you'll never be who you're supposed to be, meaning who you truly are, right? Um, and then I would say that as far as like things where I mentioned my own name, which you keyed on, um, that's actually not about me. It's about all the other older cats I know. <laughs> like this, this is like, I would say this to you because you could get this, right? I know that in our age group, there's a pride and a sense of social shaming for admitting some of the things we feel about how some of the ways we've forgotten and dismissed, but we don't feel like we could say it, but we can have that moment. And one thing I realized with poems like uh, All Asians Aspiring Gotta Hire Me Basically or uh, You're Welcome, that poem, mm -hmm. is like, I can't get free of that moment till I honestly admit that I experienced that moment. And I also wanted to put that out there because I know I was gonna get published. I know that I have a track record to tell all the other writers that we know and stuff that yeah, it's real. Yeah, it did happen to us. Yeah, we can feel this way. And yeah, we're gonna move on, right? Um, so just real quickly, those are some of the themes that are throughout the book. Does that give you a sense of kind of where I was coming from? Definitely, uh, because it was, I say this is one of your most revealing books. Uh, I mean, it was eight years be between the undisputed to well played. And, and especially from your first one, this is like, two decades old. That I love terrible. this one. It is my that favorite was, one here. That one is terrible. That's a young, look at that. Still look the same, bro. That book is everything wrong with who I was at 20, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I had to break that out. Um, but yeah, well played. You know, a lot of those poems were things I thought of when I was, a, you know, when I was performing or I gone about. And I'm like, I wish I said that. That's how I felt because there, I have felt that way. And I'm, but I never wrote it in the way or just yelled it out to the mountaintops, you know, but you said it so well in a lot of it. I'm like, I just, I was in my bed, head nodding. I'm like, I agree with that. I agree with that. I agree with that. I, all of it. And I, I'm one thankful that you wrote it, you know, and it allowed me to just, you know, have a catharsis moment with it, you know? No, but when I got to the finishing of it, I was like, I can't, I realize I can't guarantee how well this book does. And I'm really so tired of trying to be important when there's so many more voices we need to be heard out there more than me. Like, you know, I think to myself, who really needs to hear from some 44 year old dude like me? You know what I mean? When there's so many voices we need. But what I did realize is, but you know what? There are people just like me. Maybe they didn't get to go to wherever the heck I've gotten to go to, but they're just like me and I wish someone wrote a poem that told me it was okay to say, you took my ideas. I wish someone told me it was okay to write a poem that's like, I'm tired of y'all forgetting me. <laughs> I wish, and I wish there was someone who told me it's okay to write that out and then say, but it's cool because I'm going to grow, <laughs> you know? <laughs> it, it, uh, I definitely felt that when I read it through. Because almost the last poem is like, hey, guys, by the way, maybe you got, you got caught in your feelings while reading this. But this last poem is to let you know, we're cool. You know, and it's, I was like, it almost felt like a memoir in a lot of ways, mm. autobiographical book. Uh, that's why I love about Well Played. And uh, I think it's brilliant. But I, it's definitely showed me a different bow, you know, your writing style in this book. Um, how was this? How was the process of writing it? Did were you just, I know I saw back in a couple of years ago on Instagram, you were just cooped up somewhere and mm. you just writing mm. on notes and everything. It's almost like, and I was like, is Bo on a, I squad? he's on some sort of trip right now. He's, he's uh -huh. in the mountains. I don't know what he's doing, but. Well, yeah, at the beginning, I was in a mountain at the beginning, but um, no, I haven't done ayahuasca since I was like, <laughs> since 2009, I don't think, but um. <laughs> That was in Ecuador, and I'm good for my whole life now. <laughs> we'll hold um, it there. <laughs> yeah, but um, well, I'll say this. Uh, you know, every artist has their own process, and that's the thing we learn as artists, is that we all have our own way to get there. And it's taken me three years to write this book. 
but I actually only, it took me three years to give myself the permission to write what I needed to write. Mm. It took me three years to be okay with only sharing the moment and not the definitive, right? You can get held up being like, oh, I got to be definitive. And it took me a while to get the permission to be like, the moment is important too. And it also took me three years to get to the point where whatever I'm writing has to be okay regardless the external result. And I'm not talking about how people feel, but meaning whether or not it's quote unquote successful or not, I have to be okay with it. Right. That's what took the longest time. I actually wrote it. But speaking to the thing you were talking about, I did an art exhibit to, to get to a layer, which is what you saw. I did two complete drafts of the book of which none of the poems from those drafts appear in this book. Um, <clears throat> I went through a lot of very uh, difficult emotional times. And then basically what happened is in 2019 from August to late October, I wrote the entire book at the Burbank Public Library, which is part of why I'm doing this talk with you because woo, woo, woo. I gotta let y'all know who don't know this, like I've inferred, I haven't had money for many years and I needed a personal space that wouldn't charge me for $5 coffee in order to write every morning. So every day I woke up in the morning and I would just go spend most of the day in the library. And it was so beautiful, so necessary because I was feeling low about myself. And this was a place that didn't charge me nothing. No one bothered me. It was a place where I also got to see how much life was around me. It helped me get out of my head because I could see right? I could see homeless people having access to newspapers so they could be aware of the world. I saw young study groups of people preparing for a test with their mentor so they could actually achieve another level of education, right? I saw immigrant mothers learning English so that their paperwork could advance beyond a green card, right? Like I saw this every morning that I wrote. And I got to say, when we talk about value systems and COVID, the reality is this. I hope y'all are feeling this right now. Everything that builds community is a foundation for the new age. Everything that promotes dominance is obsolete and gotta go. Everything that requires me to be powerful and rich and wealthy for me to experience it, whack. Whack. But everything that brings us together and gives us a chance to go further than we thought, dope. So I gotta tell you, cause I'm, I'm with libraries. It's been many years for me, but libraries is where it's at. I'm glad you're back, bro, cause you know, we need you, we need people like you. And man, dude, I mean, if that wasn't a PSA for libraries, I don't know what is, but it's, it's life. We're here to serve the community. And that's what I guess also as artists, we're here to serve community through our, our creativity. Um, before we, you know, get into it, would you like to share some poems with us? Oh yeah. I'm gonna yeah. Do all kinds of poems. You know? Yeah. Uh, before we get started. Um, you want to answer something? What's up? Yeah, like who has been inspiring you as of late? You know, because you've been inspiring us right now. Who has been inspiring you in this immediate time of your life? You know, especially now. Last six months? Yeah, just or in general, yeah. Last six months. Yumi Sakugawa. Saul Williams. Um... Shanaka Hodge, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, my sister Melody, my sister Melody, like, that's the thing, what inspires me these days is like, I want to experience a level of character or humanity, and I'm like, man, how do I, how do I achieve that? Um, I think when you've done writing and stuff for 20 odd years and you've been around all the greats and legends and the legends are your friends and all this stuff and you recognize how much the craft cannot substitute who you are as a person because you've met all these people. Um, that's another thing about age and experience changing your values. Like it is so, it is so easy for me to meet someone who's clever or good at rhyming. It is very rare for me to meet someone who's genuine generous and grounded in who they are 
like when I meet that person, I'm like, what is this? <laughs> right? So yeah, um, those folks. Awesome. That's what you wanted to hear. And I, I like how you left it with your sister because uh, I also, you know, also shifted my views of who I put on pedestals and it, it went back during this time to family, you know, mm -hmm. and, and it really made me create the most best work is because I thought of them or they've inspired me by sending me a text when they used to never send me text. My mom and dad just figured out texting and it's, it's pretty <laughs> amazing. They don't know how to write paragraphs, but they'll, they'll say, if I'm hungry, you eat yet? Or, you know, yeah. are you okay? It's like, that's all that matters. Like dad sent me some words. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll take it. Yeah. My, my dad sends me like a five word thing that seems unemotional because I know they're my immigrant parents. I actually know it's, it's a lot of emotion, right? I'm like, Oh, wow. He loves me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, There's lacking punctuation, but it's, I feel it. It's a yeah. love letter. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Um, yeah, before I do these poems, man, do you want me to answer some of these questions I see here? Yeah, want... yeah. Let's, uh, you know, let's get down to some of these questions. So uh, let's go to the first one. Uh, any poets you met during your time at Deaf, Deaf Poetry that you were influenced by or made you starstruck? <laughs> uh, never get starstruck by another poet. The last time that happened to me, no, actually was never. Um, but as far as influenced by, if I don't go on that run on Broadway and that tour later, the national and international tour with the original cast, I wouldn't see how the world treats bodies different than mine in the way I did mm. and how I experienced the way black folks, folks of uh, Middle Eastern Arabic descent, uh, folks who are of mixed ethnic heritage, uh, how they're treat folks who are Latino, how they treated in this country in different places and different ways at different levels, right? Like uh, who has comfort with some of the cast, but not all the cast and, and what kind of roles they'll allow. If I don't experience all of that, that influence and that understanding and the presence of mind that they all possessed at a very young age, because we were all in our twenties, right? But they all had the presence of mind in their own ways to share with me either verbally or how we walk down the street, what their experience was. And it was such a gift that I don't know I'll ever be able to pay back that they gave me to, to how I can understand people more, you know? That was a huge gift. Amen to that, brother. Yeah. Um, Jerry Walkie says, what hair products do you recommend? <laughs> well, both now were, you know, at the time when you're doing your hair, what, what stuff did, were you using? <laughs> I'm gonna say this, like, you know, I love them creams and Aveda made a really nice, sweet cream, real nice, real gentle on the hair, you know, but I also say this part of my lack right here. I would say to y'all, try not to bleach or color your hair too much as a child. Just try your best. <laughs> <laughs> and me is suavecito pop, pomade. So that's, that's about it. Uh, well, oh, Mighty Mike McGee says, what's the best advice you received from a non-writer that influenced your writing? Damn, that, that's a good one. Good one. Uh, best advice I received from a non-writer that influenced my writing. Man, you made me realize how many non-writers I, I don't talk <laughs> to. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone thinks they write. Um, <laughs> let me say this. I would say, you know what? There was an old dude I met once, once for 10 minutes. He's the father of a dude who's a jerk. I met him at a party, the fanciest, fanciest party ever. And I was only 20 years old. And just for no reason, the dude said to me, you know what? It's one thing I've learned. Every time someone's trying to unleash heck on me, it's not really about me. It's about them. Damn. That was one of those things where, as a kid, you're like, yeah, yeah, okay, cool, cool, that's great, thank you. And then as a 37-year-old, when you're living in your bitterness, you go, oh, that's why he said that. And then you go <laughs> on this other road. And I, I can't thank this gentleman enough for that 
that information because it unlocked at a time it needed to to prevent me from going too far. See how important you just said that things, nuggets and, you know, quotes or things that people have given us unlock at periods of times that we, when we need it. Not the times when we need to hear it, but when we need it. And that's crazy that from 20 to 37 and that from that old codger, you know, leaving that you know, little nugget in your ear, you're like, whatever, dude, I'm just trying to enjoy this party. Right. <laughs> then getting older, you're like, that's what he meant. <laughs> I don't know your name, sir, but thank you. Right, right, right. So, um, yeah, I think we were good with questions. So, um, let's like to bless us with some words. Yeah, let's do some poems. Let's do some poems in honor of Danny and this event and the topics we address today. So, all right, I'm going to mute myself and focus on you, brother. I know. Thanks, dude. Okay. This one is like, this uh, so important for me to write because I hear this a lot and I decided in, instead of letting them run the narrative on me, I was going to run that narrative. So here we go. This is called Has Been. Holy shit, it feels good to be a has been. Cause you know me has been an addict to writing until I'd forgotten my face. Rage until I lost my voice. Regret until I started slow deathing the future. I has been a son blaming his parents for America. A friend getting got cause never taught boundaries with white people. A partner chasing love to run from everything I don't like about myself. I has been forcing the issue instead of listening to my heart. I has been unaware of anxiety until I coma at the party. I has been insecure to the point of staying on my knees for belonging, has been the poet who helped white poets feel diverse, has been the poet who gave passes to white men's verse, has been the poet hiding worthless at the expense of others through brat expressions of power, has been the poet who almost kept working with death, has been the poet who almost got stuck in the beats bedroom, has been the poet who almost didn't see the twist in the legend's story. I accept whatever fate befalls me cause I has been too hung up on getting mine, too victimhood, as denial tool to fuck boy in a love ploy who has been so depressed shutting it out so depressed letting it be definitive so depressed wondering why my life didn't turn out the way early accolades suggested it would based on all the things i read by colorless poets in the quiet room didn't see that the trophies the trinkets and the treats of triumph weren't the only things I has been. Stuck in diminishing returns of celebrated angst was once the dragon sleepwalking through caverns claiming golden, waking in truth to release this regret, beginning to let go of all that deludes and the standing, oh, standing in my own in order to release this regret and growing out of all the things I've been that would never fulfill this destiny. Hey, yo, so real quick, y'all, uh, you know, the lighting looks dope. I know from y'all in, but I could barely read those words and almost mess that up. So I got to up my lighting just a tad bit. Give me three, eight seconds. Woohoo! Well, uh, Bo works on the lighting. Um, if you guys are feeling it, put a one in the chat or just clap in your rooms. That's all about it. All right. Okay, I can, I can read this better. Cool, 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 cool. So we talked about that poem, uh, that poem, uh, Don't Be That Guy in a way. Like this idea that um, when I was young, I wish I'd written poems like this, but I, I didn't. I had to write about when I get the money in order to win a slam, I guess, which is what it was. But let me find this poem, Don't Be That Guy, because the 17-year-old in me really wishes 
he could have spit something like this at a, at a high school open mic. It would have been a, a great chance for me, you know? But it is what it is. And here we are today. Don't be that guy who always has a reason for not being racist, who gets so incensed by the call out he suddenly lists every non-racist thing he's ever done, who behaves as if get over it is something all y'all Papa Johns would do, who thinks racism is what dissertated institutions dissertate the tenure it is, who only wears and sees racism as burning cross, who believes his lot in life means he could never be, who has donations, posts, friends and rallies on hand as a shield from accountability, who can't see the nuance of it through tailored threads, who is so afraid of blame, he refuses to consider responsibility, who shows up on Halloween, shamelessly in blackface, yelling out to the whole room, what's your problem? Yeah, so I need to make the light even brighter because my old eyes. <laughs> turning up the lumens, turning it up. I can't even see. Yo, I like your shorts, bro. Oh, I'm thanks. My, about... sister, my sister made them for me. Does she take, uh, you know, uh, uh, submissions? You know, I'm down to buy some. <laughs> okay, I will, I'll, I'll talk to her about that. Holler. Um, <laughs> So this is like, cause you know, I don't think I, I'm, I'm nearly as gray as I used to be. But what I do know is that I have an opportunity to help others achieve their power. So I wrote this poem, I'm a voice, to say what I'm a voice for. And I wrote it not for you to, to be like, oh, that's me. But for you to be inspired to write what you are a voice for. I'm a voice. For the ways depression can cost you. For the stunted growth and struggling to sustain baseline. For the fear model that sets the house adrift. For the body that allows them to behave like white men. For those just now discovering the healthy of boundaries. For those who've only had blowing it up to protect from harmful relationships from those who hate themselves into both greatness and collapse. For that one person curious the cost of chasing should the curtain ever close. For the 40 year old artist who thought their contribution would become their coronation. For the 40 year old Asian who finally realizes their victimhood does not excuse their misogyny. For the 40 year old a hole who's still disappointing the metaphor of pronouns for that kid not satisfied being less whack than the wackest in their crew for Asians susceptible to enabling racism for Asians fighting history to not perpetuate supremacy for Asians who have grown out of their size cause F the patriarchy my voice rings out for rebels too rebellious for James Dean posters, for the misunderstood who keep it moving till the world catches up, for the nuance within the scope of the range in the context of relation to all, for those who are willing to say goodbye to all the rewards that ruin, for those willing to learn love till it becomes the North Star of their lives, for the child I once was, climbing out of clinging to other voices in order to listen to myself for a change. Woo! Woo! <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. Um, what do you got? You want me to do one more? What's up? Yeah, just one more to go. One more to go. Okay, so we was talking about Asians, AAPI, you know, and about symbols. So this poem, the title makes it seem like it's about me. But I actually, specifically on this poem, also thought about you, Danny. 
because you are a vital part of your community. And the younger generation doesn't understand what you could show them. And in each of our individual local communities, there is someone like us who may not have this, that, and the other, but who lived it, who walked it, and who has a sense of how to make it easier for those who follow us, should they be open to it. So, in this poem, every Asian aspiring needs to hire Bo Sia, basically. All my lovelies on the come up. The game still ain't the same for you. The ceiling less a great wall visible from space, more an all-consuming fog unseen in the shadow of power. Unwritten rules abound in places yet acknowledged by cartographers path still ends before the finish line, even as progress propagandas that is all gravy. The way paved to evolve your place doesn't change the fact that you still have one. To those toasting the bankroll of their entitlement, to those getting work off your trauma's grace, to those demanding you keep striving as a reaction to them. I paid the price to discover what lies beyond the story of glory told possible for us. All the booby traps data didn't tell you about. Every friendly gesture hiding a deadly blade. The slow sand of lingering vampires. Each archetype that will exploit your trust for clout codes within condition definitions keeping you comforted by false supporters how you may be uplifted only to crash harder the big fall the moment you quit living for the love of milk i lost my mind so you don't have to I wore all the masks to find out what's behind the cellar door. I spent these years wandering the wasteland of washed. I know how to keep your rise from being at the mercy of monuments to eras that erased you. And it can all be yours for the introductory low cost of releasing the ache to be embraced by ghosts removing the blindfold to supremacy, reclaiming the house you've kept secret in order to move. When you're ready to pay the price, call me. Woo! <laughs> Everybody, Bosia, oh, oh my God. And thank you for that last poem. Um, I'm gonna take it to heart and, and live up to it and still connect with you because I have a promise to make to myself yeah. and to the people out there to be honored that. Yeah, um, so number one, everyone, thank you so much for joining us in this conversation. Y'all need to really do your best to help Danny and support him because he is trying to bring libraries back into our culture so that we do not suffer a lack of learning amongst our population, but rather expand it as we will need it for the future. Number two, Danny, we had to get on a phone call within the week to start the process of you completing this manuscript. Number three, if y'all dug these poems and such, please consider getting this book well played you can get it you know wherever books is made and gotten you know these days on the computers and uh fourth uh, i also do creative work on other on jams like the instagrams if you wanted to follow me there and because i'm east asian and can't land on a four fifth be as kind and generous with yourself as you are with others Osea, thank you so much, brother. Thank you. See y'all later. Later, Have guys. Support libraries, support artists. Afternoon.
Be well to yourselves. Late.